A very warm welcome to some of my Filipino friends this morning. Colin from Cavite. We've got uh, Janet from San Fernando, uh, Jerry from Jordan, Australia, and Amigo from Aruba in South America. Very warm welcome to this church this morning. My church is nz.com. My name's Ken Noble, ministering this morning from the Word of God. New Zealand, hear this. New Zealand, hear me. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word afresh to us again this week, as we turn to the book of Micah, give us a fresh and relevant insight of your message that you want this nation of Aotearoa, New Zealand, needs to hear for this troubled times to which we're living in, the confused time to which we're living in. We're living in a time of terror, a time of war, a time of confusion. If ever there's a time we need to hear from you, it is now. Open your word and give us a new understanding. Amen. Today's religion is championed by mostly change. The churches want change. Churches want tolerance, mystery, something mysterious, engaging and self-entertaining rock shows in the church. We've taught a generation that truth is personal to you. Truth is not absolute. There's nothing absolute in the gospel anymore. Truth is subjective. Where scripture says the word, thy word is truth. Nothing outside the parameters of the word of God is truth. Tolerance is an essential ingredient to those that have different values and different gods and different religions and different ideas. Tolerance we must be. Today's religion accepts change. A change in moral standards, a change in religious standards. The God says, I am the God that changeth not. Everything here is diametrically opposite and opposed to God's standards and God's word in a worldly religion that we are sitting in. A study has shown that the church shopping has just now become a way of life. And one in seven parishioners change churches every year, all trying to find all trying to find this mysterious God. He's there. He's out there somewhere. He's moved. He's gone. We, not, we know not how to find him anymore. And surely the classic is that God is so mysterious and so far removed from man. He's like Star Wars. A force rather than a heavenly father. A clergyman once said to me, I asked him, is God personal to you? And he answered and he said, I've never been asked that question before. Then he thought for a second, the one thing I know he is, he's tolerant, he's changing, he's mysterious, he's accommodating, he's undefinable, you can't pin him down. Yes, he's all of these things. But was he personal to the man that preached the gospel? My question to you this morning, is God personal to you? Was this... Or is that your notion of God? He's mysterious. He lives out there. He's of no value. He's, it's for other people. So this morning I want to bring you to the book of Micah. We're going to do this in a couple of sections because <clears throat> it's quite a big book. Seven chapters. More than 3,000 years ago, the greatest miracle of all time occurred. And I'm sure that you people know the miracle of the deliverance of the people of Israel and Egypt from 400 years of cruel bondage in Egypt. And God opened the Red Sea. And I'm confident that you all know the story. How God's people were trapped in the gully, facing nowhere to go but to swim as the Egyptian army was behind them. It's a bit like the picture of Russia and Ukraine. The people of God have got nowhere to go except to call on God. And miraculously, God stood down and parted the Red Sea and the Egyptian army was swallowed up. And they were hell-bent on murdering them all, just like the, the Russians are hell-bent built, built, bent on murdering all the people in Ukraine. And we know in Ukraine there's many people that follow the gospel and have some notion of God. They're all praying, hoping that God will give a cataclysmic answer to collapse this tyrannical Russian government. And we know the end of the story, God swallowed them all up in the sea and drowned them with their bodies eventually floating along the side of the shores. And let this be a message to you, Putin. God could come and swallow you up and save the people from Ukraine. And his hand's not short to save and nor is he short not to drown you people.
God knows what's going on in Ukraine. Can you remember a time in your own life where God swallowed up your own, your own personal enemies? Maybe you can remember a time where you were hoping and how you'd had no idea how you were going to come to New Zealand. The immigration department was against you. Everything was against you. And you had nowhere to go. You only could rely on God that you could come to New Zealand. And God collapsed the situation in your life so your soul could escape. And you danced and you sang unto God who is like unto thee. And after this deliverance of the people of Israel, Moses did exactly the same. He stood around and he sang a song. There is no one like thee. We sing this at church often. His wonders, his majesty. He performs no government, no man, no woman can compare, no government, no Russian can compare to God who is like unto thee. If Russia had its own way, there would be no God. We're now going to fast forward 700 years. A prophet appears on the scene, Micah. And his name means in scripture, who is like unto thee. Micah's name means who is like unto thee. Who is like the Lord? Who is like the Lord? In this short book of seven chapters, it details a God that is like no other. He often spoke of the southern kingdom as Judah and the northern kingdom that was called Israel, warning the people of God's judgment. But there was deliverance in hand. The book of Micah is divided into three sections. The first part is a warning. The second is a lament, crying over the nation. And the third is deliverance. And each part of the section starts with this. Hear. Hear. Listen, pay attention, hear what I have to say, sit up and take heed. Every second, every chapter starts with hear me, hear all ye people hearken, hear all ye people hearken New Zealand, O earth and that which is in it, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy hill. Just this one verse gives us a revelation, who is like unto thee? Who is this God that can stand and command the whole world to listen, to stop, to take heed? What authority should he have to enable him? What audacity has he got to declare his name? Is this a God that knows something? Maybe he knows something that we just don't know. Who is this God that declares not only to New Zealand, but to the entire planet? Hear me. Take notice. Sit up. One thing that Micah brings out here is the high level of regard that he had for, for God. The high level of seriousness, the high level of reverence. Is that in the church today, the high level of reverence, the high level of regard? Or is it just squabbling amongst yourselves? Who is the greatest of you all? Who's on the teacups this week? Micah's not flippant or casual about God. Micah doesn't treat God as a pastime. Micah doesn't refer to God as someone you fit in on Sundays. Micah declares this statement. Who is like unto thee? Listening to God, hearing from God, is not some casual option that God has planted you on this planet for. So we ought not to be flippant or adopt a casual attitude or approach to listening to God. One way we can test our casual approach is how seriously we take the word of God. Do we just cherry pick the bits out of the word of God that suits our way of thinking? Are we serious about it? Do we read it? Do we memorize it? Do we know God's word? I'm amazed at how many people sitting in church and have no clue and can't repeat one verse out of the scriptures and never ever had a deep, full, fulfilling, meaningful relationship with God. Church is something we do on Sundays because you know why? There's nothing else to do. Nothing's open. The kids are annoying us, so we may as well go to church and fill in some time. Do we talk about it with our people? Do we declare it to our workmates, our families, our friends, our neighbours around this simple question and declare the statement that Micah said, Who? Who? Who is like thee? Just who? Or is it a head knowledge, a thing of a past or a hobby? My advice if these are God's words, hear all ye people, hear all ye New Zealand, 
Hear ye, Russia, we ought not to be casual and take serious notice of the one that sits in the heavens and high above us. Do we take more attention to Facebook? Do we take more attention to the video games? Do we take more attention to the computers? Do we worry about what other people say about us? Or, we, or are we more concerned about what God says about you? Do we take more of everything else than God? The old song comes more, more, more about Jesus we used to sing. But today it's more about our cell phone, more about ourselves, more about our own money, more about all the things that you can't even remember the following day. Do we hear and put more credence on the news at six, which is mainly lies and more lies than God's truth? Because God's truth says thy word is truth. Why do we take God's word? Hear all ye people, seriously. Why? Because there's no one like him. That's why we take him seriously. Who can command the whole world to, to stop and pay attention to this God? Who has the authority to demand such attention? Hear me, the sole source of truth. Not you, Cindy. You are not the sole truth of sole source of truth. Hear the government. Hear God, Cindy. Hear him. Hear God, all ye people in Parliament in Wellington. So Micah calls it out for what it is. Listen to the Lord, as we are a nation, would be very well to do the same thing. In chapter 1 and 2, there's a warning. Micah's not flipping about the warning. New Zealand's been warned by the ministers of the gospel in this country. Hasn't been warned by woke churches. It's been warned by people that have been baptised in the Holy Ghost and have vision of God. Brian Tamaki, Carl Bromley, Peter Mortlock, all standing up from the pulpits from the church, warning New Zealand of its corruption and its coming judgment to New Zealand, the same that was impending for Israel. The word Israel, you can just put New Zealand, you can put the Philippines in there, put whatever you like in there, but it says stop, and warning here, a warning from God. Then there's a lament, there's men praying, crying, Micah's crying over the country. Are you crying and praying for New Zealand? Are you lamenting over the evil, tyrannical government that we've got in here? Then at the end, there's a glimmer of hope. There's salvation. Something's going to happen. So let me let read to you this morning from chapter 1, verses 2 to 7. Hear ye, all ye people, all you people in New Zealand who live in New Zealand, the sovereign Lord may, Lord may bear witness against you, the Lord from his holy hill. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads on the heights of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him and the valleys split apart. The mountains of evil, the mountains of corruption, the mountains of the tyrannical government, they will be split and they shall melt like wax against the fire. Like white wax before the fire. Do we have mountains in New Zealand? Mountains of hopelessness, mountains of lies, mountains of tyranny, mountains of deception. Even in the church today, like water rushing down a slope. All this is because of Jacob's transgressions. All of this because of New Zealand's transitions and sins. Oh, the people of New Zealand. What is Jacob's transition, transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah, high place? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore I will make Samaria a heap of rubble. Is New Zealand par Parliament now a full of rubble? Full of it. Lies, deceit, full of garbage. I'll pour her stones into the valley. I'll pour all your garbage, Cindy, into the garbage can and down the toilet, God says. Here, here I'll pour it into stones and lay bare her foundations. Are the foundations of New Zealand being laid bare in front of the people of New Zealand? It was a country built on the word of God and now it's turned its back, laid bare of it. And now they're being exposed from people like the Voices of Freedom and normal mums and dads that know that there's something wrong in our country until there's nothing of any substance left in New Zealand Parliament, just bare foundations. And our idols will be broken to pieces. The money, the greed, the taxes, cost of living, cost of petrol, cost of housing are all broken in New Zealand. And all their temple gifts will be burnt by the fire. I will destroy your images, God says. Do you have images this morning and idols? New Zealand, are you looking to Cindy to the sort of source of truth truth? If so, you're looking at an idol. Since she's gathered her, gathered her gifts from the wages of prostitutes, 
Has this New Zealand gathered its wages from prostitutes, from big pharma, from big tech, sold its soul out for cash? Where did $25 million come, Cindy? Where did it come from in a few short years? You sold your soul to a prostitute. And as the wages of prostitute, they will again be used. Has New Zealand prostituted itself to the World Economic Forum? Has it prostituted itself to China, to these anti-God establishments? What a graphic description that Micah says of the judgment of God coming. In verse 3, God is coming down from heaven to bring judgment. The mountains will melt like wax before the fire. The city will be consumed by God's severe judgment. Who is like unto thee? In other words, God is coming down from heaven to bring judgment to New Zealand. The mountains of corruption, lies and rubble will melt like wax. Your city, Wellington, will be consumed by harsh judgment if it's not being judged now. Look at your front doorstep and the front pipe on the front footsteps of parliament and you will face down Cindy you will cry you will face down because God will make you face down and you will say unto yourself who is like unto thee but northern and southern kingdoms both of them both the North Island and the South Island we can think of these countries far away of Israel and Judah but we can also think of North Island and the South Island had rampant corruption, idolatry, scorning of God, and became spiritual idolaters of God. Has our country become a spiritual idolatry to God? Snubbed its nose at God? Is New Zealand scorning God in both islands, the north and the south? When you actually stop and look at the minor prophets, they are full of doom and gloom and darkness of sin. And when you read it all, you begin to think to yourself, why doesn't God lighten up? Why doesn't he have a sense of humour and just humour us all? And why doesn't he just make us all happy? Where is there hope in all of this? I don't want to read this nonsense anymore. I want to listen to Cindy. She sounds so good. She sounds so charming. I'm a prime minister. I'm above hearing from God. My parliament's well ahead of that. In fact, I don't even want to hear from the people of New Zealand. I don't want to hear any of this. I'm a Kiwi. I don't hear any of this. All you are is a doomsday again. Well, let me give you some strong thoughts on this. We tend to underestimate God's man's brokenness, his sin, his inherent sinfulness, man's depravity, and we understand most, mostly God's holiness. And we may read like chapters 1 and begin to think us to ourselves, it can't be that bad, surely. Surely things aren't that bad in New Zealand. Surely, you know, it's not, it's not really bad to have euthanasia. It's not bad to kill a baby in the womb. I mean, we need to get over it. We need to get on with it, really. It's not bad to marry man to man. It's not bad. Well, we've got to move on. If we go to the Book of Kings, we can read the sin of the nation at the time when Micah wrote this. Sin was rampant. Abortion was rampant, burning babies for sacrifices was rampant, tyranny was rampant, T dictatorships like in Russia was rampant, greed, violence, immoral immorality, all because they were worshipping false gods. And even some were offering their children as burnt offerings to God, murdering their own children. Are we murdering babies today in New Zealand in the womb? What's different about this story in Micah's time to what's happening in New Zealand today. I would suggest to you this morning, there is nothing. In fact, it's got worse. In addition to people under estimating the sin running wild in Michael's world, some may be underestimating the sin which is running wild in New Zealand. Some may be underestimating the consequences of sin in our nation believing that it'll all go away and believing that it'll all be good. I propose to you we are more like Israel back then than we as a nation would ever want to admit. New Zealand's more like I I Israel in what it's doing. In fact, looking at it, I think we're actually way worse. You know, it's easy to think as Kiwis that we're not like other godless nations. We're not like the Philippines. 
We're a free country. We can get money. We can have a good life. It's easy to think that we're not Muslim country. We're not a Hindu country. We're a democratic country. And in our pride, we look down on others in other countries, but shouldn't we have a damn good look at ourselves here in New Zealand and pull out the log in our own eyes of New Zealand? We all have the propensity. They all have a bias and dark sin. And I venture to say to everyone that's listening to this, dressed up with your pretty clothes in church, sitting next to your neighbour in church, you've all got some dark sin hidden deep in the recesses of man's heart because that's the way man is. I'm thinking as I'm telling this story of Dr. Zacharias, a minister of the gospel, the day he died, the dark sin of his life, who preached the gospel to many millions of people around the world. And then it was revealed, the dark, dark, dark life that he was living. It was such a disappointment that in the deep inner recesses of men's heart, we all are evil and wicked. The Bible says there is none good. Every one of us can sing the song, What a Rich I Am, but once I met the blessed Saviour. We need to recognise that God's warning of coming judgment to New Zealand is an act of God's grace. It's not an act of, of, of war, it's his grace. It's a warning to God, people of God, hoping that He, hoping in his heart that men and women in New Zealand will come back to him. He hasn't got a secret agenda. He's told us So God has every right to judge and punish New Zealand. Judge men for their sins. But before he does, he repented, repeatedly warns us as New Zealanders by his grace and his mercy. Before judgment, every time, there's always grace and mercy with God. And New Zealand's been given grace and mercy by some of the people in New Zealand. So when we read this verse, chapter, we're in chapter 1, we want to take this as a blessing from God. God is giving us grace. He's giving us mercy. He's giving us favour. God gets no champion thrills out of punishing people. And yet by his grace, he's warning New Zealand with, 12, with one minute to 12 now, then judgment. New Zealand will not get away with this in front of God. While we all sit around thinking it's funny what Cindy's doing and getting away with her rules and regulations, God will judge this. And Cindy will have to face God and her parliament. And look at what Ezekiel said 100 years later. Rid yourselves of all the offences. Rid yourselves of all the sins that are against me, that you have committed against me, and get a new heart and a new spirit. I suggest that the New Zealand government gets a new heart, a new spirit. Why, why will you die, people of New Zealand, people of Israel? Why will you die? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares God. Repent. Repent, Cindy. Repent, church. Repent, people, and live, the Bible says. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commandments so that it might go well with them and the children in their land forever. Incline your ear. Incline to fear me. Hear me, God says, so that it will go well with your children and your country and your finances and your life forever. Do not ever stop to think things are not going so well in New Zealand with cost of living. In a land full of milk and honey, once called God's own. New Zealand was called God's own. I don't know if we could call it God's own today. You stop and think maybe, just maybe, this could be the beginning of God's mercy leaving. The beginning of judgment on New Zealand. Do you ever stop to think that maybe we should begin to hear the words of Micah? Hear me, all ye people. Hear me, all ye people in New Zealand. Hear me, hear me from a God who is like unto thee. I know there are times we all think that God's commandments are just all too hard, all too burdensome. It's all too hard. Why bother? They're too hard, you must just leave. But can you for a moment see God's heart? Can you see for a moment, see God's passion? See his kindness, see his mercy and see his grace. But so often we forget to stop. Hear me, all ye nations. Hear me, who is like unto thee, O God? So when we forget 
We need the word of God to come back to our hearts, to refresh us and to remind us and to challenge us to the remarkable grace and favour that our Lord and Jesus Christ has given to New Zealand and our nation of Aotearoa, to which Godly richly wants us to do one thing. Hear me. Let's pray. Father, may, your, may our prayer be that this we hear from you this morning, that we may hear ye, all ye people of New Zealand, that we might hear ye, all our families, that we might hear all ye in our workplaces, we might just hear you, for there is none who is like unto thee. Spare this nation of judgment, turn our cities and parliament and your people back to the one who is like thee, O God. May we all sit up and take notice of your word, which says, hear me this morning, hear me. And now as we part and we go our separate ways, O God, bring these people back together next week to another great word and cover them with your precious blood. Till you come again. Amen.